Welcome YouTube, Sensei Martin here from the Aikido Bastards. Uh, here for another one of our videos, this is going to be a very quick one. Uh, it's not going to be much Aikido, it's going to be lots of uh, talking about theory, probably actually quite one of the most important topics, uh, basically around legislation, self-defense, use of force stuff. Uh, a lot of people join martial arts, uh, they do it for self-protection reasons or thinking if it goes wrong they can use it. Most people don't really understand where the powers come from. So join me in a minute and we'll talk through all you need to know for a very quick uh, introduction to use of force. Lovely, thank you for joining us again. Uh, right, we've come through a couple of things, a little sort of a disclaimer and preamble before we get into the meat of it. Firstly, this video has come about from requests we put out to people on sort of Facebook groups and YouTube and that sort of stuff we put out to. Uh, it's come from a captain Chris Harrison, someone we've been conversing with. He wanted to do stuff around use of force. What he actually wanted was a number of scenarios sort of run through, saying this is lawful, this isn't, this is that's justified, this isn't. Uh, it's actually really hard to do. Firstly, it's very subjective to what I would think about that, what other people would think about it. Secondly, circumstances train. So what, you might do one scenario, some things, oh, that's applicable to another scenario. The circumstances might be different, their perception might be different, so actually, you can't really give a one-stop shot fits all. Plus, it's infinite. There's an infinite number of scenarios, infinite number of responses, infinite ways that can be reinterpreted. So that really wasn't viable. Hopefully, what this will do, though, is give you a fairly crash course into it. A uh, couple of disclaimers then. One, firstly, it's UK legislation. If you're following it from another country, it might not be relevant to you. Uh, I can only apologise on that. You have to look into the laws for your own country. Secondly, if you actually need advice around using force, i.e. you're in trouble with uh, police, lawsuits, or you're teaching or involved with that sort of industry, take professional advice. This is going to be a fairly short, sharp video. It's not, you know, this is a topic that you spend hours on as a legal person, as a solicitor, as a police officer, or whatever it is you're learning. So to cover it all in a 34 minute video just doesn't do it justice. Uh, yeah, this isn't affiliated to any group or organisation, this is just the interpretation of myself on the Aikido Bastards giving you a little bit. Ideally taking you from somebody who knows zero to knows a little bit. It's amazing when people you ask around, and ask around your own clubs, you know, you do martial arts for self-defence, for using force, where does your powers come from? Most people will sort of say, oh, I think I can do it, but I don't know where from. So this will hopefully give you an understanding of it. Uh, and I'm going to break it down and I'm going to get into what I call the kiss mnemonic. Keep it simple, stupid. I.e. we're all a bit stupid, we don't know what we're talking about to start with. Keep it nice and simple, because that is what is needed. Complicating it up much more just makes it a bit more hard to understand. So anyway, we're going to break it down. There's three bits of legislation that you kind of really need to focus on. They're the crux of what uh, law or self-defence is to in the UK. Right, first one I'm going to touch on is probably the big one. It's one that sits over everything. Uh, it's the ECHR Article 2, so European Convention of Human Rights, Article 2. Uh, it's essentially what's called the right to life. Uh, firstly, if we leave, if Brexit happens, we leave, we're still going to be abiding by it. Uh, and it's, um, it's the one I'm going to read from my phone because it is quite wordy uh, and we'll break down the key parts of it afterwards. So, uh, everyone's right to life should be protected by law. No one should be deprived of his life, his or her, intentionally saving the execution of sentence of a court following his conviction of a crime for which the penalty is avoided is provided by law. 
break that down, ignore most of it. Basically, your right to life and the right to life of the person you're engaged with is protected. You cannot breach that unless it's sentenced by law. So if they still hung people, that would be fine. We don't do that anymore. Very few countries do do it. So it's kind of, just take the first part. Everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. Full stop. That's the key part, point one. Point two. Deprivation of life shall not be regarded as inflicted with the contravention of this article when it results from the use of force which is no more than absolutely necessary in defence of a person from unlawful violence in order to effect a lawful arrest or prevent the escape of a person unlawfully at large, lawfully detained, sorry, in action, lawful action taken for the purpose of quelling a riot or insurrection. Again, I'm going to keep it simple. Those last two, bin them. We're not talking about riot situations, we're not going to talk about citizens' arrest and that sort of stuff. So, what we're talking about, some key words there, yeah, defence of someone from unlawful violence and using no more force than absolutely necessary. They're the key bits of that legislation you need to pull out, start thinking about what it actually means. It's a stricter test than the other bits of legislation we're going to talk about, the ones which you'll go to as your defence. This one, so this kind of sits above everything. What you might do is you might actually have a defence in common law or section 3 of the Criminal Law Act for something you've done. If it ends up where you've taken someone's life or seriously injured them and someone that extent, you might not actually have the defence on the article too. You might have breached that even though you've acted lawfully in the other actions. And it's mainly around the proportionality of the offence threat faced and the necessary part of it is could something have been done differently. So you're looking at the unlawful violence uh, that is exactly what it sounds, you know, if there is someone committing a lawful violence to you or another person, your objective is you have got to be trying to stop that unlawful violence. If someone's run away from you and you've gone after them and you hit them, well that's not that you prevent that unlawful violence. You've got to be stopping that unlawful violence. That kind of makes sense in the fact that you see the people fall foul of this, you know, many big stated cases where someone's committed a criminal offence, that person has left the scene and is fleeing and they've used lethal force or excessive force on that person and you can argue are they trying to detain that person or are they seeking some sort of retribution and if you're not preventing an unlawful act this defence is starting to get a little bit cracked cracked around the ends and if it starts to creak and crack that's when you get into trouble. The main aspect of article 2 is all around the absolute necessary. Is the force used absolutely necessary? So you might have it justified but actually what we're looking at here is were there lesser ways of achieving that objective? So if I'm fighting someone and I pull out a knife, stab them and kill them, I've, have I achieved my objective and preventing lawful violence? Potentially, yes. Were there lesser ways I could have done that? Could I have put them into a lock? Could I have held them? Could I have put them into a choke or strangle them? Could I have done something else which would achieve the aim in a lesser way? If the answer is yes, then you look at there as actually, was it absolutely necessary? Were there other options that could have been taken that could have negated that force to being used? And this is probably one of the big areas. Uh, there isn't a, some recent changes changed some stuff around, uh, you don't have to sort of extract yourself from situations, however it's still available. Think of, a, think of a situation like this. I'm sat in the pub, a uh, bloke comes over, starts picking a fight with me, literally out of the blue, swinging punches, boom bang, fist fight happens, he hits, he goes down, he cracks his head and he dies. Now, I've then breached his Article 2, I've taken his life, there'd be a defence, was it absolutely necessary, were there other options I could have taken? Well, actually, I was just sat there, the next thing I know, I'm getting attacked, so I've got no other options but to start defending myself, and in choice of that defence, I used a certain amount of force, and there'd be an argument, was that reasonable in the circumstances faced, which will determine there, but the point is, I didn't really have much choice, it was there. Same sort of scenario, bloke stands over and says, right, I'm going to finish my pint, in two minutes time, I'm going to come over there and we'll smash your head and put you in a coffin. I'm sat there. There's door staff in the pub. The landlord comes over to me and says, oh, do you want to phone the police to get up somewhere there? I say, no, no, I'm sitting here. I'm not doing anything. I choose not to move from my seat. I choose not to leave the pub. I choose not to go and pick the door staff. I choose not to take the advice and phone the police. I make a number of choices not to do things and take different routes to avoid that conflict. Bloke comes over, starts throwing punches, we end up in a fight, punches get thrown, he falls down, cracks head and dies. They'll then look at that, was it necessary? Well actually, did I have opportunities that could have prevented that situation getting there? The answer is yes. And actually then, I'm not saying it would be 
look pretty awful, but what you're saying is you're starting to get cracks in that defence. It's some say, well, was it absolutely necessary for you to use that amount of force? Could you have taken other options? Could you have precluded uh, other avenues? Did you preclude other avenues you could have taken? Did you move, did you move and say, and we're all starting to get into that slightly murky area. So what you've got to come back to there is actually, whenever you're using force, are you doing so to prevent some sort of unlawful violence? If the answer is yes, that's kind of the first stage of this tip. And then, is it absolutely necessary? Are there other options you could have taken? Are there other ways you could achieve what you were trying to achieve uh, without using the level of force you have? If the answer is no, then chances are what you're doing is compliant with this. Even if you used lethal force potentially the last as a, the highest outcome. However, if what you're doing isn't achieving these aims and there are other options, and it's fairly obvious there are other options that you could have taken, your defence in this element of legislation is going to be slightly skewed and you could find yourself in breach of it, and in which case you could end up in a real big trouble. So, Article 2, literally, in a fast run through it, key parts unlawful violence, are you defending you or yourself from someone from that? Is it absolutely necessary to use that level of force to achieve that aim? Right, are you still with me? Next one, this is section three, section three of the Criminal Law Act. This is probably going to be your main go-to bit of legislation you use. Uh, it's it, it basically it covers all the main sort of points. It's, a person may use such force as reasonable in the circumstances in the lawful arrest of suspected of offenders, suspected offenders, persons and lovely at large, and in the prevention of crime. That is in a nutshell. Now there's a lot within that. Let's cut out what we don't need. We're not going to talk about uh, arrests uh, or it depends on people unlawfully at large, push them to the side. A person, well we're all people, so unless you're a registered alien from another planet, it's kind of irrelevant. The key parts to it are Prevention of crime, force, reasonable in the circumstances. They're the two main kits we need to break down to. So let's talk about the first part, prevention of crime. Uh, this has to be fact-based. So you have to actually be preventing a crime, uh, not sort of something you suspect you think might be a crime. Uh, it has to be a crime. If it's not a crime, i.e. you walk into a film set uh, and people are doing something, you think, oh my God, it's like carnage here. You know, they're, they're not committing a crime, they're, you know, they're, they're doing their normal stuff, it might look like a crime, you might perceive it to be a crime, they're not committing a crime, therefore this is going to fall down for that part of it. And you've got to kind of think, in your proportionality test, what crime is it you're trying to prevent? Uh, there's some state cases, I think it was very recently banter on the internet around someone choking someone out in America, putting like a strangle choke hold on, all this stuff, doing like a systems arrest, I think there was an off-duty officer there as well, and the offence they were going after was urinating in the car park. Okay, it is an offence. You ended up using high levels of force. I think the person might have potentially died or had some serious, severe injuries. And as a result, for what, what offence are you dealing with? It's kind of got to be proportionate. If I'm at a bus queue and there's someone eating packet of sweets, littering, I think he's, you know, he's dropped one bit of litter, second bit of litter, goes to drop a third bit, I go up, clump him. Have I prevented a crime? Yes, I prevent him littering. Is it really proportionate? What's the harmful level of impact of that crime? Uh, Okay, keeping it simple, let's look at what we're using self-defence martial arts for. It's going to be probably three areas of crime we're going to be looking at. Uh, stuff that's violent towards people. Simple. Starts off, common assault, which is basically an unlawful apprehension of violence. That's someone me raising the fist going, you know, I don't have to say anything. That, that to someone, what most people think, well, there's some violence coming. That's your common assault level. And it will build up all the way to murder. And in between that, you've got APH, GBH, GBH, then sort of murder levels. Yeah significant stuff. Uh, you're then looking at other offences that are going to have sort of quite high impact on people, so robbery, you know, if someone gets robbed, it's quite a nasty offence, a little of violence and fear used within it. Uh, if someone was smashing your car up with a boat trying to set fire to it, something like that, again, quite high level impact offences, that's what you're, you know, concerned with. Are you looking at this force for people littering? No. Are you looking at this sort of force for someone verbally abusing you in the street? I would suggest not. They're relatively low offences. What's the impact on that on people? That's what you've got to consider for these force. And then the only third one you probably look at is some things where there's p the potential for impact is very severe. Obvious one is easy. People, someone throwing breeze blocks off a motorway bridge onto the motorway. Now, actually, it might be if there's no cars coming, that's not going to cause an immediate impact. But if you're all driving and you're driving that motorway and there's a massive breeze block and you hit into it, what's the outcome of that? 
quite severe. Can you be justified in using some force to prevent an offence like that? Potentially you could be. You see where I'm going with this. You've got to think, what's the impact of that offence to justify my involvement in it? Uh, come back to the last one. The, probably the biggest point we're going to try and point here is that reasonable in the circumstances. This is the bit that pops up from time to time and this is the crux of is what you're doing proportionate? Is it reasonable in the circumstances? Because this, this is the matter that it's going to get reflected on in courts. Uh, best way of breaking down reasonable, the, the simplest way I can describe it is think of a seesaw effect. Uh, and you've got the threat on one side and you've got your response on the other side. Now they kind of need to balance. Now you don't need to have them perfectly balanced, but what you don't want is your side to tip to the floor and hit that side of the floor really badly. Uh, and if you think about what I'm saying, threats or the level of violence, think about the likelihood and the severity. People there might be trying to go, that sounds like a risk assessment, but it kind of is. You know, if I have a gun, pull the trigger and the bullet comes out against someone's head, the severity of that, they're probably going to die, the bullets can do a mass amount of damage. The likelihood, quite high actually, because that's what bullets and guns are designed to do. So actually, on that side of it, you've got high, highest severe outcome, highest likelihood, really high sort of problem, threat, level of violence. If the response to that, if someone's shooting at me and that sort of stuff, my response is fairly the same, I discharge fire back or something like that, it kind of balances. What you don't want to do is be in a situation where your response massively outweighs the response threat. So, bloke comes into a pub, he's, you know, five stone, uh, small, drunk, stone on our own place, and he says to me, I'm going to smash your face in. You know, the severity of that threat, actually, you know, if I look at his body weight and stuff, yes, you know, you can get people who, you know, you don't, don't, don't discount me, don't know, but the reality is, is body weight is half of what I weigh. Uh, he's, you know, he's not going to really do much damage to me. He's drunk, he's on top of that sort of stuff. If my response is, right, I'm going to draw my firearm, as before, put it to the head, poof, there. The threat, the likelihood and the severity of the threat posed to me is down here. My response, somewhere up here, boom, that's going to tip. Is that reasonable? Not at all. Uh, what you're kind of looking for is sort of balance. It doesn't, it doesn't have to balance. You can kind of be swayed, but what you can't do is your your response can't massively outweigh the threat faced. That's probably the easiest way of trying to get a visual representation of what reasonable is. Uh, think of think of that the severity, likelihood. You know, is what you're doing somewhere in the ballpark. Might be slightly more than that, but that's fine. That's not an issue as long as it's just not crazily excessive. The other simple judge of it is if you tell someone the output, what you think it would be, and you see their jaws drop, mouth go open, and everyone you tell does that response, it's probably a bit severe. Therefore, you're probably not being very reasonable. Circumstances, well, they, the best way to think of them is they, they almost have like sort of context that uh, reasonable for. So actually, the circumstances, they've got to be fact-based, they've got to be as you've seen, and they've got to be quite genuine. It can't be that you feared that any minute now, we're going to take over, so the circumstances, you were really paranoid. It's irrelevant. You've got to be reality, you've got to be what the circumstances now in the situation is. And they might change actually what is reasonable in those circumstances because what's reasonable in one set of circumstances might change in different set. And again, this is, this is a very rough scenario, so don't take it as gospel. I walk into a pub, I support a football team that wears a red top, for example. I don't follow football, so don't really, that's why I haven't named any teams, so I probably have a team name wrong because so I'm not a football fan at all. I walk into that, into a pub, sit down at the bar, bloke wearing a blue top, those teams don't get on, wherever it is, says to me, right, you know, at my pub, I don't like you, starts throwing punches. I pick up, uh, there's a baseball bat inside the bar, I pick it up and I start smacking him with that baseball bat, he goes down and there I am. Is that reasonable? Well, and again, j just for example, actually the threat stuff pose is kind of here, my response is kind of up here. People might say that's not really that reasonable response. You've gone over the top. You know, again, I'm not going to argue. People, people could argue the other way around, but I'm going to say, let's say for example, we think this time that's a little bit unreasonable because of the response, the threat faced, the response I could have done with it, other things I could have done. My response is probably slightly over the top. So, use this exact same response but change the scenario slightly. I walk into that pub wearing my red football t-shirt again, sit at the bar, door locked behind me. I look around the pub, the pub is filled with football fans who are wearing blue tops. Guy comes up to the bar, they're all looking at me, I know that door's locked, 
bloke says, you're in our pub, I'm going to knock you out again, blah, 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 put you in a coffin, start throwing punches, I pick up a baseball bat, defend myself against him, and I'm there, ready to defend myself. Same, same, exactly the same response, I've done the exact same thing I've done in the previous scenario, however the circumstances are different now here, because I'm thinking, well actually, I'm locked into a pub with people who don't, who are aggressive towards me, don't want me to be there, and they've shown a little aggression. So actually, change in circumstances today means, is that response slightly more reasonable? Just an example, these aren't, that example isn't a hard and fast example for me to say, right, here's one, but what I'm saying is, I'm trying to evidence that if you change the circumstances, actually, what's reasonable in one environment might might be like, might be reasonable in another one and might not be. And that's where it came back to the whole thing at the start about people saying, right, here's a scenario, is this justified, is this reasonable? It's hard to context that because the circumstances sort of add a level of context to where you're in uh, and that's where we go from there. So, to summarise section three, you've got to have, firstly, are you preventing a crime? That's what your goal is. If you're not preventing a crime, uh, if, so, if there's two people fighting, someone's knocked your mate out, you're making them a little cold and you're, the, the person's walking off, you know, we'll talk about citizen's arrest, that's a whole other topic another time. If that person's walking off and you go up and clump him, are you preventing a crime or are you seeking retribution? If you're not preventing a crime, you sort of always dip this first test. Second part of it then is reasonable in the circumstances. So actually, think of that seesaw, the, you know, the threat likely, the severity likelihood of the threat coming in, your response to it, threat, you know, severity likelihood of what you're going to do to it. Are they kind of in the same ballpark? Are they balancing that seesaw to some degree? Is yours going to crash that seesaw to the floor? If it is, I would suggest you don't want to go there. And then the circumstances, they add that context to it. So, you know, what, you know, what is it you can see here, feel the smell, all that sort of stuff around you, and to that situation that you're in, because it will change your response options, and that's by the way you're justifying it. There you are, section three. Again, that's normally done in months. Uh, you know, you can almost study that for ages, and we've crashed here in probably about 10 minutes. Hope you're still with me. This is the last one now, uh, common law. So, it's not very really hierarchical, but this is the sort of, your default one, if you're using force, should be your section three powers. That's what you should be looking at. Uh, common law features into that. This, what it says is, if you have an honest held belief that you or another are in imminent danger, you can use such force as reasonable circumstances to avert that danger. Bit wordy, bit oldish, but actually we can break that down very simply. Reasonable circumstances. We've kind of heard that before, that come from section three. So actually, extract that a bit out. We know that. Reason and circumstances. Let's think about the first part yeah, about averting the danger. If you, if you believe someone is in imminent, you or another in imminent danger, use such force to avert that danger. But what we're saying here, we're not saying an offence, we're saying danger. There's got to be imminent danger and your response is averting that danger. So they're intrinsically linked. Uh, this one actually doesn't cover criminal offences. So actually, this is where you use force all the time. And like most people say, it's fairly obvious. You know, if someone, if you need to do something to save someone's life, could you do it? Most people say, well, yeah, of course you would. You know, if someone was about to jump off a bridge, could you grab hold of them and put them back on? Yes, you could. If someone was about to jump on a train track, could you stop them? Yes, you could. Well, where does it say that? Well, this is where it says it. You know, if someone is in imminent danger, you can do it and avert that danger. So let's take the boat crossing the road, playing Pokemon on his phone, something like that. He's going to step out in front of a car. You see that, you run over, clothesline him, boom, take him to the floor. What are you doing? Well, you've not stopped an offence because it's, it's not an offence in the UK to cross the road, jaywalk, and they call them, you know, it's not an offence. You have used force to avert someone getting run over, to avert a danger. Uh, so that kind of adds to them. The best way of thinking is it's like that preventing an offence, but it's not, it's preventing some sort of danger, some sort of harm coming from someone. The reason you're doing it is to, because you've identified it and you're preventing it. Those, those two last bits linked. The next part of it, then think about it, is what we call the honest held belief. Now this actually covers the fact that where I said in section three you needed to have a criminal offence, and if you don't have it, you haven't really got that defence in law. This one sort of takes that away to actually you're 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 acting in what you think is the best in the best situation. So you're thinking you're doing what the right thing is, and it covers you if it's not always the right thing. Uh, belief, you're looking at sort of seven eight out of ten, so it's not. You know, it's got to be something you believe. Best times this, I believe my car's in my drive. 
an hour ago, I drove it home, I parked it up there, the keys are hung up where I hang my keys. Not saying where, but there you go. Uh, and, but I don't know it's there. You know, between the hour it's been there, someone could have come along, broken into it, I could have left the door open, someone's come in hot wire, driven it off. However, that's mostly unlikely. An hour ago, it was on my drive, it's on my drive every night, and it's yeah, and I've got the keys, I'm only other set of keys uh, with my wife who's at work. So, you know, it's fairly strong to believe that my car is on that drive. That's the sort of level you're, you're going at for your belief. Uh, now, why is, this, why is this important? Well, actually, I've covered about it's not being a criminal offence. So, I'll give you an example of this. I walk into the bar and I see my best mate Paddy uh, and another bloke standing at the bar. The other bloke raises his fist like that in front of Paddy. I walk up to him and think he's going to assault my friend, he's going to hit him. I'm going to prevent a crime here from happening, I'm going to use reasonable force. So I go up, do some sort of like keto technique, a wrist throw, a coat of the edge, whatever it is, put mate's boy on the floor, pin, thank you very much. Paddy, I saved your life there, you know, he was going to hit you. Paddy says, well done, Martin. Thank you very much. Section 3 of the Criminal Law Act, perfectly in play. He was going to assault my friend, that's a criminal offence, he put him in fear of violence, therefore prevented that crime, chick, tech. Use reasonable force, well actually, he was going to punch someone in the face, I put a wrist lock on them, take them to the floor, balances out quite nicely, check. Powers, section 3, everything's in order. Come back in the next night to that pub, same two people there, Paddy and this bloke were talking at the front bar, I walk up, I see the bloke do that again, I think, you know, I'm going to do it again. So I walk in, he's going to assault my friend, friend of crime, use some force on it, bang, 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 wrist lock on, thank you very much. Paddy, I saved your life again. This point, Paddy goes, no, 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 actually, I realised I knew him, we were having a conversation, actually what he was saying to me was uh, that he's taken up boxing, so I asked him to show me his boxing stance, and he stood there and he was showing me his boxing stance. Right, let's look at our panel under section three. Have I prevented a crime? There was no crime. They were talking, conversing. He had asked him to show him a boxing stance. He had shown him that. At no point was any crime about to take place. There was no criminal element there. Check. Cross. I haven't got prevention crime. Therefore, my Section 3 powers are out of the water. I essentially have used force on this person. Everyone goes, oh, crikey, unlawful. And I go, no, common law. I had an honest held belief. I walked into that pub. I believed that person was going to punch my friend. There's my honest held belief. I've identified the danger he was going to punch that person in the head, which I thought was a criminal, which I thought was going to be the case, and I thought it would be a criminal offence. So I've used reasonable force in the circumstances to prevent that danger. Crash bang wallet. Doesn't matter. There's no offence. It was what I believed. This, what I believed happening. What I believed those set of circumstances were telling me was that there was a danger there. I had to use reasonable force to avert that danger. If I've got it completely wrong, that doesn't matter. What was my honest hell belief when I walked in there? That's the crux of what common law does. It doesn't give you an out for getting it wrong. All it does is it covers that, that actually you might make a reaction or something and you get a half second. If, if someone pushed you from behind, you turn around and all you saw was a pair of fists like that, you might think, well, I'm under assault, I'm going to do something. It might not be the case. The person behind you might be your friend who thinks that would be quite funny if I push my friend and then go, pretend I'm going to box him. You turn around, crack, oh dear. Again, no criminal offence there, but that, that's giving you a justification to what, you, your, what, what, you might, what your response might have been. It's because what would you believe was going on in that time? What was your belief in that set of circumstances? And then the rest of it, reasonable circumstances, we'd cover that with our seesaw, circumstances could change it slightly, uh, and you know, what was, I, what was I doing with that? So that kind of breaks down where common law fits into it. it it's very they're all three are very intrinsically linked. You know, you've got the absolute use of force, the absolute necessity test with the Article 2, your Section 3 powers, which is your go-to powers, and then actually, if you get something slightly wrong, if it wasn't as you believed it, but actually what you believed was going on was, you know, was in your mind and that was what happened. Your common law then helps you support it from that. So if you had to add a conclusion to all three now, almost like a three-stop test you want to apply. First thing first, are you, one, either preventing a crime or trying to avert some sort of danger that's got to be imminent, so it's happening here and now? If the answer is yes, that's almost your first step done for the use of force. Secondly, can you balance that sort of balance of use of force? And we talk about that with that seesaw, 
you know, your likelihood severity of risk that you're coming into you or a person or whatever it is you're doing and your response, are they on a par? If the answer is yes, you've got that second part. Third part probably says, is there any other way of achieving what you're trying to achieve? You know, if someone is trying to start firing that stuff, if you can do it, if you can get yourself out there, brilliant, that's how you do it. If you can do something that minimises the force that you have to need, brilliant. So you go to the door, start phoning the police. What can you do to try and minimise that threat? Take those options. And if you don't take them, have you got reasons for not taking them? But if you can apply those three stage tests, chances are you have a good understanding where you'll be able to go is, is apply the force in a proper manner. So as I said, I hope you've liked it all. So please share, like, subscribe. Uh, this has been a very fast run through. As I said, this topic is something you get taught with for hours if you do any legal training or anything like that. This is a massive topic. So to condense it into this very short period is a very snapshot. Don't take this as gospel. This is just taking you from hopefully someone who knows nothing. So when, when they when their sensei says, right, how do you know what you use force? You know, how do you know what you can do justified? Most people might sit there and go, I don't know, but it must be justifiable somehow, but I just don't know how. Now you've got an understanding. Take this, read those three bits of legislation. There's loads and loads of context around it, there's loads of bit of case law. Wikipedia will give you, you know, a couple of screens worth of scrolling on your phone. So, you know, understand that because it's important. You're a martial artist, you know, you're either teaching other martial artists or you're practicing martial arts. The sad reality is one day you might have to use it, you might end up using force on someone. If you don't know why you're doing that, and the worst case happens, you end up being arrested, you end up going to court, you end up having to justify yourself to other people. It's nice to have a starting point and think, actually, this is why I was doing it. I had a, you know, I had a some defence in law, I had a rationale in my head to why I was doing what I was doing. I hope that's of use to you. Thank you very much and see you in the next video.